Hello there, sword friends. Today I'm going to tell you about this sword right here. It is an odd one in my collection, and really this is going to be a rambly conversation about an odd duck sword that's in my collection and that I've been trying to sell for a number of years. But it's a fun little thing. It's got some cool quirks and features, and I want to run through them, and so hopefully you find this random, rambling, conversation-ish type of video helpful or interesting. If anything, if you had some ideas about a custom sword project yourself and are wondering how some of the colors might line up, uh, maybe you'll get that. The blade is also a cable steel blade, so um, that's at least fun to look at. Anyway, uh, the sword is made by a fellow named Christian Griazzi. At least I believe that's the case. I've been unable to verify it, and so that's, I guess I'm taking it on faith that it, uh, that it is. Um, the sword is also mounted up by Fred Lohman, and what I see seems to be symptomatic symptomatic of that. Anyway, it's got some interesting bits on it, and I think it's a really handsome sword. And if you were thinking about having a sword mounted up, uh, well, then this would be... One way to do it. So this is a Handachi style set from Fred Lohman. At least I believe that's the the type of Kashra this is. And I think it, it's it's handsome. It's got this little window here where you can see the Samagawa through it. Uh, sometimes there would be like a, a brass ring or some sort of ring that would go through where the Ito would, would slide through. It doesn't on this one. You don't necessarily see it every time. Uh, but it's a it's a nice looking piece. The transitions here are nice. Now this Ito is some of my favorite. It's this kind of it's Fred Lohman uh, Tsunami Ito, and I don't think you can get it in gray anymore. This was one of the the, uh, the gray handles that he had made from this material. The downside to this gray is that it starts to age and show signs of handling really quite quickly. This sword really hasn't hasn't had much other than a few bits of handling, and it, it already begins to show. But I do think this gray color is very, very handsome. I like the, the way it looks, particularly on this black Samagawa. Uh, you can see there are nodules here, which are uh, on the smaller side. There's no emperor node. If you're doing a sword project, uh, a lot of times you can see these these Samagawa nodules are tough to see under here. You can save yourself some money if you're going to spend a lot of money on a skin. Uh, the black really, really covers it up. So it's one way you can actually save a little bit, justifying not spending the extra 100 or $200 on a, on a nice skin. Uh, just put <laughs> black lacquered Sama underneath it and... Uh, and well, like I suppose that's a trick. Because if you lack it, you can certainly spend a bunch of money on a very expensive panel, uh, but you can see that the nodules don't stand out as prevalently as they do if it was not lacquered black. Anyway, uh, these are kind of Oni face masks in terms of the uh, in terms of the Manuki here. I always thought that these would be one of the more attractive Manuki to use on the Oni katana. Now, the Oni Katana is one from Hanway. I happen to have a fitting set around, but I always thought that these Manuki matched uh, that fitting set better than the ones that come with it. Anyway, uh, I, one of my favorite sets from, from Loman's uh, offerings, but this is a, an Oni face Manuki. There's the upside downy face. These Oni faces, I, I think they're, they're particularly cool looking. The Ito is not as tight as it could be, but it kind of fluctuates. It's still very serviceably tight and nice enough, but it moves under some pressure. The Fuchi is cast, but Loman does a pretty good job with his casting quality overall. It lines up, the transitions are pretty good, uh, and it matches the fitting set quite well. The Suba is a really plain design. There's no moan or anything like that on it. I think it fits uh, the, the overall theme on this sword quite well. The only thing that really stands out in terms of decor is really the the oni faces or the the masks on the manuki um i think it would have been okay if there was a moan with a, a demon face placed on here somewhere but um, that's not not what was done now this is again i believe a fred loman suba um without really much but it, it's it's convincing looking i suppose in terms of being a, a relatively simple looking antique style suba but it's as modern as every all the other fittings on here I'll talk about the Saya a little bit more. Um, this Koguchi is, is metal, and I like that from a user standpoint, uh, but it wiggles around ever so slightly. I imagine that could be fixed with a dab of glue. Uh, it's been painted and also has kind of a sandy texture on the top, not something I'm, I don't know, I have mixed feelings about it. It's reasonably well done overall though. Now I can't remember exactly what these pieces are called. Um, this kind of towards the back of the Saya here you can see that there's this metal fitting that's that's on here. Now these are <laughs> are supposedly quite challenging to put on without scratching up all of the lacquer on the side. And the lacquer on this is 
reasonably well done. It's not it's not perfect, but it's pretty well done. Uh, so getting this this piece all the way up the saya without marring the the paint horribly is is a challenging thing to do. So it's nice that it's on here and it keeps the saya from splitting open if you smack somebody with it or bang it on the ground or it ages poorly. Um, so it's nice that it's on here, I suppose, is the main point. It seems well fit. It's not terribly wiggly, but it does have some play under pressure, which means, you know, it'll probably loosen up more over time. Uh, last bit down here is this uh, this fitting cap. And again, it just wiggles around a little bit. It's not, not as tight on here as it could be. Uh, but again, some small amount of glue would probably resolve that issue. It seems like the fittings on here were just not not enough adhesive was used or whatever adhesive has been used has not held up uh, terribly well over the the long periods of storage that this sort has seen. It's seen a lot of temperature changes. Living in Minnesota there's a lot of humidity and temperature changes so it's possible the glue's just uh, just loosened. Anyway, it's all fit enough but you know just wiggly. In terms of other wiggliness you can hear the Suba has a good amount of play in it. A lot of the fittings on the scabbard have a little a little wiggle. It could all be tightened up without too much too much issue. Some well placed pieces of adhesive would uh, would probably shore everything up reasonably well. But I'm all thumbs when it comes to that stuff, so I prefer to let the next person give it a go uh, unless they want me to try it because it'll probably come out uglier than it needs to. The hibaki is nice enough for what it is. I mean, it's a simple enough looking piece. Obviously, it could be fit a little better, but the hibaki actually still holds in the side reasonably well. It has the kind of scratch pattern. But now I'll talk about the part you may actually be interested in, and that is the blade. And this blade is, um, well, the polish on it is not necessarily great. You can see the tip is uh, not exactly burnished in a way that is terribly great. It has a serviceable uh, functional polish on it and it does bring out some of the characteristics and what you're seeing here is kind of like a, a snakeskin. This is a cable steel blade. So Christian Griazzi, as far as I understand, was a student of Michael Bell and I, Michael Bell has forging classes as I understand it. Now I don't think he ever completed the program or was certified or anything like that, uh, but he did study how to make uh, blades under Michael Bell, who notably makes uh, cable steel katanas. I have a few that at some some point I may show, and it creates this really interesting pattern on the surface of the steel. This kind of snakeskin looking thing uh, is is the result of kind of that that technique or that material. And it has a lot of interesting kind of surface features. It it creates a very unique and interesting hada, but it also seems to create a lot of <laughs> flaws. I don't know if I want to call them flaws because it seems uh, a part of every cable steel blade, but if I zoom in here, you can see what looks like a little inclusion or cold shut or uh, supposedly this is neither of those. It's, it's supposedly a burnt out bit of steel. The little wire in the cable, depending on how tight it is or even if it is really tight, uh, some of it just burns out or or doesn't weld. So it's it's not likely going to impede the function of the sword or it's not some sort of terrible detriment that would uh, cause it to, to break in use. Uh, both of the Michael Bell blades that I have, who are, who's, who's kind of the, uh, the master of the technique, if you will, all seem to have similar examples, not, not as big as this necessarily, but all have uh, bits of steel missing, um, which, which mar the kind of perfection on the on the surface but you can see there's little little pockets here that uh, well that that are frankly to me are quite unsightly <laughs> it, it doesn't leave me with a huge amount of confidence in in the structure of the steel but i i've been told by folks that have used these cable steel blades that that is is not a forging flaw the same way that uh, like a cold shut would be and that it shouldn't shouldn't dissuade my confidence in swinging the swords um, I have one particular Michael Bell blade, which has a smaller amount of these imperfections, but still things like this are, are present on it. Uh, and it was used pretty extensively on harder targets, and it, it never bent or had any, had any issues. It proved to be a very resilient blade. So I guess I don't know if that is the case on this one, but uh, that seems to be symptomatic of, of these blades. Now this is a, a somewhat large 
imperfection, but at the same time, I guess that's somewhat par for the course for, for cable steel. Still, the surface of the steel is really cool. And if I look at spots like this that don't have those flaws, uh, it does make a really cool and interesting pattern. I, I do dig the kind of scale look uh, that it has. It's really quite an attractive feature. Unfortunately, on this example, the tip was <laughs> not polished as perhaps well as it could. But otherwise, the lines on it are, are relatively straight and clean and nice. Um, it's a handsome sword for, for what it is, certainly. Now, this sword has some obvious flaws. It's got wiggly this is and that's, but overall, it's actually a pretty handsome sword. Uh, a lot of the little imperfections are things that are certainly within the realm of remediable, and it doesn't really have that much sign of use, obviously. It's got a myriad of things that you could complain about, but for what it is, I really actually like the aesthetics of this sword, this kind of gray suede-looking handle on gloss black with these gray fittings, I think actually tie together pretty well. My eye doesn't inherently jump to one spot or the other. Everything is a, is a good mix of bold and subtle at the same time, or at least I think they aesthetically play well to my eye and my tastes. Now, dynamically speaking, I'm not really gonna do much. I'm not gonna cut with the sword because it would devalue it. I'm, I'm planning on selling it. It's a little short for me. What I can tell you is that it is a stout feeling blade, but it's nimble enough. There's nothing bad or odd about this sword that makes me well, brings really anything into question. The lines are clean and nice. Perhaps the uh, apex of the curvature is, uh, you know, a little little forward, more forward than it is on, on some swords, but not so much that it doesn't seem um, like a inappropriate katana shape. Uh, it moves well. It balances fine. It's comfortable enough to hold. It makes some rattling noises from a user perspective, but many swords do that, and it's it's just something that needs to be remedied, and I suppose I could get off my ass and do it, but I'm not gonna. Anyway, uh, the interesting bit about this sword is that it's attractive. It's got a very nice mount on it, but it also has a lot of odd imperfections, obviously, from a user perspective, and the, the sign has some rattly bits. But the imperfections on the blade itself really are, are often a deal breaker for people and very scary. You might think it's gonna break or it has some fatal flaw. Nobody, nobody wants to buy a blade like that. But at the same time, it's a cable steel blade and that has a lot of allure to it because it's very uncommon and it's fun to see and fun to look at and just different and cool. Um, it's unfortunate that it has as many imperfections as it does, but the more I have cable steel swords, the less frightening I guess I find it because all of them, even the ones made by the people that seem to know them how to do it the best, seem to have similar imperfections. So if Kristen Grousey was a student of Michael Bell and hadn't necessarily perfected the process, uh, it makes sense that his, his would have more of, of those less desirable features. Anyway, it's an interesting sword. Um, I like the, the look, certainly, and that's probably my favorite thing about it. And every now and again, I take it out just because the, the pattern on it is so bold and cool. Anyway, that's, that's what I've got on the sword. There's not really much else to share. If you have any questions, throw them in the commentary down below. I'll do my best to answer. Anyway, that's all I have for you. As always, cheers, and thanks for watching.